And so my lab published a report finding that we took 11 women with full-blown type 2 diabetes and in just 90 days with just these simple but not always easy yeah. interventions, Carb these four control, pillars, protein, fat, and fat. family fasting. Yes, and fasting. we took those four pillars and in just 90 days, every single one of them had reversed their type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. No drug injected, no pill popped. It was simply by changing what was going in their mouth and how frequently it was going in. So, yeah, within within weeks mm -hmm. to just a few months, a person can totally reverse all of this. In fact, it's so fast that if, if a person listening to this is a type 2 diabetic on multiple drugs, like you're taking a drug for your glucose, you're taking a drug for your blood pressure, you actually need medical supervision because you may need to start getting off those drugs within as little as a few days. It's that quick. So all of these chronic diseases that we're all familiar with, you know, cardio vascular, metabolic, if you can stabilize, if you can become more insulin sensitive, you will improve your situation to the, uh, the point of reversing whatever that disease is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, I don't want to, it's hard for me to make a, a perfect exclamation mark claim to that, but to some degree, so I'll soften it a little bit, to some degree, you are either going to fully reverse the problem or substantially improve it. Like, for example, type 2 diabetes, it'll be gone mm -hmm. um, based on multiple reports, my own included. Mm -hmm. You can remove that disease without even a hint of it. Alzheimer's disease, if we're talking about our kind of 80-year-old grandma with significant Alzheimer's, no. Right. You've done some irreparable damage to those neurons, and they're not going to come back. However, the evidence is also clear that you can still improve it. Mm -hmm. So maybe, Grandma, you're not going to perfectly correct the memory and some of the deficits, but now maybe she can get up and dress herself, um, which was something that was reported on in some of these case studies that I referred to earlier. So to some degree, you can reverse it. If not all the way, even any reversing is better than just slowing the decline. So there's a laundry list of symptoms that would make me believe, okay, so I might be insulin resistant here, resistance here, and I need to go to the doctor. What would be What would be that kind of those warning signs or that laundry list. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've already mentioned high blood pressure. Mm. That is a really consistent, reliable marker. So if someone has high blood pressure, uh, it's it's likely that you have insulin resistance that's driving it. There are other causes, but that's the most common one. Um, actually, we don't even need to look too far. The skin can be a window to the metabolic soul, if you will, where as a result of insulin resistance, a person can start to manifest with two distinct skin disorders coincidentally, both around the neck. And this can happen anywhere skin is just folded and kind of rubbing. So it can happen on the armpits or the groin area as well. But two distinct disorders, one is called acanthosis nigricans, which is a term to describe a darkening of the skin. Mm -hmm. Now, depending on someone's natural pigment, it can be harder to detect this or not. Uh, if you're a pasty, freckled guy like me, it would be pretty obvious. We're right around that kind of collar line of my neck. I would see this darkened pigment, kind of a coppery on my skin tone, a coppery um, section of skin. But that's not the only one because you also, w with that disorder though, mind you, even still within that same problem, you can also have a, a kind of, it's often referred to as a tissue paper texture where it's like you've taken a nice sheet of tissue paper, crumpled it up, and then opened it back up. And so the skin is really just crinkled, I guess, for lack like of a crepey? better. Yeah, yeah, crepe, yeah, yeah, okay. like a crepe kind of ish paper. So right again, right along that same area. And that's helpful because if a person has a darker pigmented skin, you might not see the pigment change, but you will see the texture okay. change, that crinkled skin. That's one problem. Mm -hmm. The second, and people will know this probably as I describe it, skin tags. Mm -hmm. These are not like a mole or a mound of skin. They're like small little mushrooms, like microscopic little mushrooms that you will also see along the neck or the or the armpits. And, and those are also these little teeny columns of skin, a secondary sign. Uh, so if someone has acanthosis nigricans, the crinkled, darkened skin around the neck and or skin tags, those are almost proof positive of insulin resistance. Now, the nice so you should News? be sprinting to yeah, your doctor. Yeah, absolutely. If you notice this, and I wow. bet someone listening, if they don't see it on themselves, I bet they have a loved one when they are hearing me describe this and they think, oh, yeah, I, I, my, my mom has this or my, my older brother has this. How early should we, we be testing for insulin resistance? Yeah, I would say. The, and how, how do we do it? Yeah. Like, the, what are the best tests? When the person has come out of puberty, mm. now you can start to rely more on some of these best tests. You can't rely on blood glucose. We need to measure insulin. So if insulin levels 
are around seven or so microunits per mil in U.S. units. And in the U.K., um, in other metric countries, it'll be kind of around 40 picomol. Yeah. Um, that's a good sign. That means insulin is low in a fasted state, which is evidence of insulin sensitivity. As it gets beyond into the teens, kind of mid-teens, I'll say around 16, 17, that's a kind of warning stage uh, where it might be a problem, but it might be fine. The reason I have to use squishy language here, which is painful for a scientist to do, is that insulin has a rhythm to it. And it's possible that you're catching it at a bit of a high point, whereas if we would have measured it two hours later or two hours prior, maybe it would have been a five um, microunits per mil. And so there is that wiggle room, which we need to account for maybe some other markers. But then anything getting into high teens and 20s, that's too high. But then in the midst of all of this, we can look at another marker, which is a really good surrogate, and that is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. So someone listening, take your triglycerides as they would come in milligrams per deciliter mm -hmm. and then divide it by the HDL cholesterol number. And if that number is below 1.5 and the lower, the better generally, that's a good sign that you have good insulin sensitivity. So it's a surrogate but very good marker for insulin sensitivity. And blood pressure? Is that like how we triangulate? Blood like, pressure is another one. Yeah. Are yep. the clinicians triangulating like this? Oh, no. No, not at all. But I, I do think, yeah, you and I, I, mean, I, I know what you and I have in common is a hope that the message is definitely spreading. Mm, I mean, the fact yes. that I'm even here, mm. a metabolic scientist talking with you and your platform, this is evidence of things moving in the right direction. 